be a technical operations manager for SGS. I'm a product manager for the IATF, at least a veto authority for that scheme. I'm also a lead auditor for the environmental side, uh, quality, safety, and uh, recycling. So safety, of course, being ISO 45001 for all those standards. Uh, and I train people in uh, these standards. I did all the training, or at least I participated in the training for the 2015 versions of these standards. And so, you know, right now, currently, I've been right around uh, 21 years of, you know, of uh, experience working as a third-party auditor. I've worked for three different registrars, and I've been self-employed. And uh, my background, uh, I live in uh, West Michigan, so my background's been automotive. So we won't get into all the background or anything, but I do want uh, everybody to understand that I have been involved in the environmental health and safety side. Uh, environmental since around 2000 was when I started doing audits. And uh, since I started doing audits, I have earned my graduate certificate in environmental management. And also, uh, we have um, just recently gone through from the health and safety side. Uh, last year, during the, the shutdown and, and COVID-19, we pretty much all of our auditors that do health and safety went through uh, training through OSHA Academy. And I'm also a trained uh, uh, safety professional. Okay, thank you very much. And let's get on with the rest of the presentation. Just to give you a little bit of a background, if you're not familiar with SGS, uh, SGS has been around since 1878. I believe they started as a grain inspection house. And in the uh, mid 20th century, they diversified into things like uh, inspections, testing, and verification services. A lot of registrars have gone through the same path, starting out with inspections or uh, certification of some type and get into the uh, third party. Uh, in 1981, they were listed on the Swiss Stock Exchange, and today we have over 140 plus years of experience. You can see here that uh, we're a world leader. We have uh, 89,000 employees, 2,600 offices, and 11 global industries. And um, what I do for a living is part of one of the business units. As you can see from this slide, uh, the area that we uh, represent is knowledge solutions. We work with certification, uh, training. We're starting to uh, uh, really increase that amount of activity. Uh, we do customized audits. I have audited uh, as a contractor um, for a large multinational corporations doing their first party audits, as well as representing um, large clients for second party audits. And we also work on a, you know, transparency one, uh, basically to minimize the supply chain risk. And then also uh, we do technical consulting uh, within our group. And that's really just to try to improve your productivity and your operational efficiency. Okay, so this slide basically is talking about the SGS difference. We believe that because we're a global um, and we have local ex experts, that we can partner with industries and regulatory associations to pr provide you industry experience or expertise, uh, quality of service, and global through a global network. Uh, there's many times that I'm doing audits for uh, partners in Asia and Europe and in South South America. Actually, I've done that quite often over the last tw 12 years that I've worked with SGS. And then we, uh, we're we looking to be an end-to-end -end partner. Uh, we can support you in many different ways. Here's a slide for the agenda for today's webinar. Of course, these are the bullet points that were in the announcements, so there's really no need to go through this word by word. But just to give you an update, we will be looking at the historical background of you know, the occupation health and safety management systems, where they came from, where they're at now. Uh, looking at the benefits for ISO 45001 and we look at some of the industries that might be beneficial too, we want to look at um, you know, just an overview of the requirements for ISO 45001. And we're trying to compare these to other uh, management systems who all use standard language as uh, a baseline, a fundamental foundation. We're going to look at the factors for you know, migration, success, uh, looking at some of the barriers, the pain points, by the time we get to that point in, in, the, um, in, the, in the presentation, we might not have a lot of time, 
but we're going to look at least at the, the more common things. And then, of course, we're going to talk a bit about how uh, SGS might help you in that migration process. Now, this part of the agenda is really offered as historical background of the occupation health and safety management systems, where they started and where they're at today. So they started out with actually being a British standard. Uh, it was published and managed by the British Standards Institute. And when they did that, they, they published it under the Occupation of Health and Safety Assessment Series. Now, I often wondered when I was younger and then when I first started doing this, why it was OSAS instead of OSHA? And that's the answer there is that it's not promulgated. It wasn't published by the United States. It was published by um, Great Britain, the UK. And when they published it, they published both the OSAS 18001 and the 18002. And whenever you hear uh, what number two in the series, it's usually the guidance document. It was published in 1999, and that's the, the actual version that was part of my training originally when I first started doing uh, occupation health and safety management systems was a 1999 version, and I was trained around 2005. So in a couple of years after, they came up with a new version. That was 2007, and that was the last update that they had before it moved over to their, the current standard numbering. So there was a greater emphasis in the 2007 version on the health and health and safety aspects. Now, they've made the decision to move the uh, 18,001 from the British Standards Institute over to internet, the International Standards Organization, or ISO, and they're the ones that issued the Occupation Health and Safety. Now, their technical committee, number 283, deals with occupational health. So they took over the whole process of getting 45,001 published. You know, it goes through a committee draft, final draft, uh, uh, it's international standard, and then it goes to the to the to be published as an international standard, and so it is built upon the concepts that are found in the early standards, the eighteen thousand one, but also the ILO OSH, OSH guidelines, along with national standards. Like in the United States, we have ANSI Z10 and the Voluntary Protection Program, and all the, both all of those were were uh, very successful. It just took a while for the 18,001 to catch hold in the United States. And so when we talk about the general guidance, that's under the 45,002. Now, there are some things that the technical committee is working on, and we're hoping to have future webinars on some of these concepts because for some reason they have not written the 45,002 yet, even though it's been almost three years since the standard was written. So I'm not sure exactly why they're doing that, but they're working on other things too. They're working on ISO 45002, which is the guidelines. They're working on 45003. Uh, the other things, other um, standards inside of the series will be 45004, and that's really some guidelines on how you would evaluate your performance. And then, of course, there's more uh, guidelines on safe work practices, and all of those projects are part of the ISO Technical Committee 283 and that's what they're currently working on. And we're hoping that in the future, this will be um, some subjects that we can have uh, future uh, webinars on. One thing that is really key to note is that the ISO standards are meant to be a generic standard. And that's not the wording that we use. That's not the wording that auditors came up with. That's wording found right in the ISO um, in their website when they, dis when they describe these international standards. These are generic and they're worldwide standards. The 45001 adopted, um, when they adopted this, that was intended to enable organizations to provide a safe and healthy workplace, but also to prevent the work-related injury and ill health, and also to improve upon, um, you know, the performance of the occupational health and safety systems, management systems. And these are words that come right out of the standard. This is found in 0 0.1, early parts of the standard. And so really, ISO 45001 has a purpose. That's to provide a framework for managing the occupational health and safety risk and opportunities. Now, there's a lot of flexibility in here, and there's many, many hours of talk that could happen about 
ISO 45001. So we're just going to be able to hit the highlights of some of the things that we want to do within the agenda. But when we talk about intended outcomes, and this is wording we hear from the accreditation bodies and the international accreditation form, um, one thing we were looking for is continual improvement of the occupational health and safety performance. Uh, of course, bare minimum would be fulfilling the legal requirements. And then, of course, the other thing would be if you, whatever your company has decided to do for its objectives, we're going to look to say, are you able to meet those objectives? Are they designed properly? Or, or also, based on your performance, is it just something where it's just way out of whack and we're going to need to take a look at that? Those are the, the intended outcomes of, of this type of system. And every system has that, whether it's quality, environmental, or, of course, uh, the health and safety side. And here's a chart that kind of shows you some of the areas where, in 2019, the highest number of fatalities and work-related injuries. So you can see by far, and I say by far, the outstretching of the, of the numbers uh, is construction industry. And think about it, the, the number of hazards that are there, um, many of us may know I do personally of people that have actually uh, suffered a work-related injury in construction and passed away, actually. Um, you know, so construction industry, transportation, and warehousing, I believe one of the reasons for the warehousing, if you think about it, are two, two factors. First off, it, depending on the size of the distribution center or the warehouse, there may be multiple powered industrial vehicles running throughout the plant. So one of the most hazardous things that we have in the U.S. is being struck by. And then the other part of it is you have a lot of material that's overhead. And if it's improperly stacked or the racking is not right, then there's a possibility of somebody being struck by, again, but on their head and shoulders, causing issues. So I think that um, you know, as you look through here, you can see that there are industries that are going to be more um, uh, more beneficial to have occupational health and safety. But no matter what, again, this is a generic, universally applicable standard, but it might be more appropriate to some of the ones that have the higher rates of injuries and fatalities. In this section of the agenda or the presentation, we're going to go through some of the structure of the ISO 45001 standard. And what I mean by that is that uh, one of the goals that the ISO organization has in the past decided to pursue was to standardize or align the management system standards, whether they be for information security or quality, environmental, and of course the occupation health and safety standards. So by increasing the alignment, they're able to develop a they were able to develop a common high level structure and for a while it was called Annex SL. Now I think it's called standard language. Uh, and that is meant to define a lot of the common text. It doesn't mean that they're all cookie cutters though. There are still slight variances, and we'll, be, we'll talk about that in a minute. But that uh, Annex SL has actually become some of the uh, written into the ISO directives. So at the very highest of area of the ISO uh, world in their directives, they talk about this standard language. And then that the result is that every management system, every standard that's written as a management system has a, the same 10 clauses. And out of those 10, clauses 4 through 10 are the ones that are auditable, the ones that you can get certified to, and the ones that find all the requirements that you, that, that auditor would typically look for and look at. So even though there is a much commonized wording in these clauses, there are still uniquenesses. There are still unique concepts that depending on the management system and the focus of it. I'm not familiar with things like the information security, so I can't speak to that, but I can speak to things like quality, environmental, and health and safety. So for in the 14,001, for instance, it talks about life cycle perspective. Um, that's unique wording that's not found anywhere else. 
Other things that it, it, it uses, we used to have this thing in 14,000 called legal and other requirements. Now they've talked about those as one concept called the compliance obligations. And if you look closely at the definitions, et cetera, it says those legal and other requirements that you need to maintain or be compliant to. And then, of course, consultation and participation of workers is something that we will talk quite a bit about in this presentation because it is such a unique uh, item and it actually falls all the way from the policy through leadership all the way down to consulting with them on a regular basis, them being workers. So this is how the difference is there. And, of course, in 9001, you know, we have things like uh, risk-based thinking, et cetera. So we will talk a little bit about that uh, in the following few slides. This slide will be discussing a little bit about the clauses. We mentioned that in the previous slide, is that with this standard language, we have the same 10 clauses in every management system standard. The first few for every standard are what we call non-normative, which means a norm is a standard in some languages. So the non-normative means there are no requirements. They're there for your reference. Uh, many of the uh, standards have an Appendix A. That Appendix A is also for guidance only. Uh, it, some standards give you a little bit more information than others uh, when it comes to that uh, Appendix A. But regardless, um, when we look at clauses 1, 2, and 3, there are things like the scope, the normative references, and then the terms and conditions. But you won't find any shall statements in there, so there's nothing really to implement or to, or to audit as, as third-party guys. So we look at the different clauses. There are, again, there are four through ten. Uh, they're pretty much the same. We talk about context, uh, the organization, uh, leadership, uh, planning, support, operations, performance evaluation, and improvement. The one thing of note here is that we said, as we said, each one has standard languages, but there are definitely some differences. And so what we're going to do is we can see it right here in Clause 5. Clause 5 says leadership and worker participation. So in, in my opinion, when we look at worker participation, it actually has been permeated throughout the 45,001. And in the past, it was only in like one part talking about communication and it had maybe one or two shell statements and that was it. Now you find it in many, many places. We'll walk through that for you. So the key here is to understand that we have these standard languages. If you have already have 14,001 or 9,001, you can use that structure but you will have to be aware of some of these key differences between the standards to help you in your migration from the 18,001 to the 45,001 and help you to make that a smooth migration from one standard to the other. I wanted to make sure that we pointed out some of the significant wording that's noteworthy within 45,001. So when we talk about um, the, the, the major structures, the context of the organization always talks about understanding the needs and expectations of interested parties. Well, they changed that wording a bit. Now, maybe a really minor change, but it's, it's kind of significant. So we talk about it as really emphasizing workers. It says understanding the needs and expectations of workers and other interested parties. And it's not saying it's the other way around, like, okay, interested parties and maybe your workers. It's really focusing, I think, in this case, on the workers. Uh, another example of this is in uh, Clause 5. That's under the leadership side. It says uh, it's not leadership and commitment like it is for the other standards, but it's leadership and worker participation. And they follow through with this emphasis in that uh, subclauses, those are the clauses that go below the clause five. Those usually there's 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3. And dealing with the management system, the policy, and the uh, leadership and commitment. In this case, there's actually another section, and it's pretty long, actually. Uh, this section deals with the consultation and participation of workers. And there's two major subsections of that, which is one is talking, obviously, about consultation, and the other is talking about participation. But even though I say that, before I move on to the next bullet point there, even going back to the leadership and commitment side, the leadership and worker participation, they've actually added quite a bit of wording and, and requirements. Uh, we'll walk through those a bit uh, into that fi section 5 or clause 5.1. 
So, and this last bullet point is uh, 8.1.4, which is entitled procurement. And I found that to be really, really curious because uh, since 1999, I've been doing quality audits. And uh, up until they issued 45,001, there was no other standard other than maybe like, I'm not familiar with things like um, medical device, and I know those are based on 9001. So any other standard that's not based on 9001 doesn't have a word about procurement. They might talk about contractor controls, but that's usually people doing work on your facility or bringing chemicals into your facility. This is talking about the procurement activity, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, and how it will have an effect on who you choose as the contractor through the selection process. So these are really, really important things to understand, and hopefully they'll help you with your transition as we discuss them. Of course, when you think about an international standard, the highest part of the little documentation pyramid that they used to show in some of the standards back uh, a while back, and um, they had this at the very top was the policy statement. The policy is, in many ways, just below your mission and vision statements. When it comes to a, a management system standard, there's always going to be a policy involved, whether that's quality, environmental, you know, any of the other ones. And so this now, what they've talked about in the ISO 45001, one of the major changes is that your commitment, what you're committing to in your oh policy for your management system must include wording that talks about committing to consultation and participation of the workers and where they exist workers representatives now we know that representatives like this are probably talking about some type of organized labor or union leadership so when we have those we need to include them in our commitment and so the really uh important point to this is that as you migrate to this standard, you need to look at what your policy says because that is something that majority of the time, and I'm not going to say maybe 90%, but it might be a little less than that, but the majority of the time, unless you've had a really progressive thought pattern uh, for your organization and your organizational uh, behavior, et cetera, we're probably going to have to make some significant changes to the policy and the policy commitments within your documentation. Also, when we look at this, uh, we talked about this, I think, in the last slide, but you have to understand the needs and expectation of your workers and interested parties. And, and I think that that's an important emphasis to make because I think in, in, in some ways, in other standards, maybe the workers, you know, are thought about but it's like a, they tack it on at the end, right? There, I think in this emphasis here is that we need to think about the workers because this is occupational health and safety. It goes right into the wording. So the emphasis should be on those workers. And then their needs and expectations, you know, a safe work environment, be able to come home uh, as they leave, as they came, you know, as healthy as they came, not becoming uh, sick at work or injured. And of course, some of these requirements could definitely become legal requirements. Now, in the United States, of course, we have the Code of Federal Regulations, CFR 20. You know, 1910, 29, 1910 has all of these series of regulations. But in some countries, you may have other regulations. You have to understand that if you have a multinational company, you need to make sure that you understand which of these needs, like we talk about consultation and participation. And in Canada, if you have somebody on a safety committee with a joint health and safety committee or called something else, uh, if you participate in there and you have to be able to do the job, then you have to have some certification, some train level of training. Uh, recently, I was in an audit in Canada, and they talked about being able to, you know, uh, I think they, they can refuse. I'm not sure the exact terminology, but uh, the workers can refuse based on uh, safety concerns, and then the Joint Health and Safety gets involved in certifying that decision, and so that's where you have to be trained on that. So, you know, depending on where you're at in the world, you may definitely have requirements that become legal requirements. And so that's important for us to know as we go through this whole process of, of migrating into the 45,001 standard. Okay, well, this is um, talking a bit about what I mentioned a minute ago, where they have expanded on one of the existing 
clauses, uh, 5.1. So now every standard that I know of, there's a few wording differences or whatever. They all have the, you know, they, they go to letter A through E. If you'll see here, <laughs> this goes from the five basically shall statements of the other standards to having, uh, I think I called it 13 there. 13 different requirements compared to five. So some of the really important things here, just to, again, talking about it, uh, just so you can understand some of the differences, is of course, uh, we're talking about intended outcomes. So we talked about that early on, right? What are those intended outcomes? And so you know, one of the parts of the management um, leadership and commitment is to make sure that they, they uh, demonstrate commitment through ensuring of course, sharing means you can delegate it, right? But ensuring that the uh, system can achieve its intended outcomes. Another idea there is a directing and supporting uh, persons to contribute to the effectiveness of the OHS management system. So again, these are concepts that uh, aren't in uh, other standards because they're not about occupational health and safety. We want to ensure that there is a continuing activity trying to promote the continuous improvement. And sometimes that might be pre preventive things. That could be something where um, they're trying to promote the, the identification of near misses or possible hazards, like a unsafe condition, unsafe act. You know, these are all positives because they're, they're trying to be preventive in nature rather than waiting for an in injury to happen or illness to happen uh, on the job, right? Uh, we want to make sure that we're trying to continually improve in other ways too, like infrastructure support or things that happen to do with projects that we're doing that would improve uh, safety, maybe more automation, less ergonomic risk, et cetera. So those might be some other examples of things that we're doing for uh, promoting continual improvement. The really important ones are the ones coming up here where it talks about uh, the management roles to demonstrate the leadership that applies to the areas of responsibility, the developing, leading, and promoting a culture in the organization that supports the intended outcomes. Okay? So, in other words, this, again, this is what we were talk I was talking about a minute ago. We don't want it just to be something that's written on paper. We want to be able to see, and I think this is the intent of ISO 9001, excuse me, ISO, yeah, getting ahead of myself, ISO 45001, to make sure that um, it's more of a cultural thing rather than just being on a piece of paper and having all these work instructions. That's one of the reasons I think that ISO kind of has gone away over the years, different iterations, versions of it have gone more and more to less prescriptive, here's the documents we need to, okay, document it the way you need to, but make sure that we can meet the intended outcomes overall. So we want to make sure that happens. We want to be protecting the workers from reprisals when they're reporting incidents, right? The hazards, the risk, and opportunities. So we want people to have, a, we want to promote this culture within the organization, but one of the things we need to do is we need to make sure we're protecting the workers. So what might I look at if I'm looking for that as an auditor, right? Well, one of the things I ask is, is I ask management how they're doing that. I make sure, okay, what are this? They might give me some examples, but then they also follow it up with such in such areas as say uh, human resources. And what do we have that how you communicate is how are you protecting workers from reprisals? It could be something as as direct as being in the employee handbook. Okay, I remember there was a few organizations, then a couple of them may have already had that in there, but they beefed it up. Right? They 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 made sure that they let everybody know again. Some people have been there for a long time, right? Maybe decades. It's been a while since they've read through all the handbook. So making sure everybody understood that and, and, and reemphasizing the fact that uh, we're not going to, you know, let anybody, um, you know, take any action against somebody that is just reporting uh, unsafe acts, or, et cetera. And then we want to make sure that there are processes for consultation and participation. You know, how will we do that? Um, one example of that, of course, is going to be uh, safety committees. You know, something along that line. Now, granted, we are living in the area, in the era, I guess, if you will, of COVID-19. And we know that there are some struggles. We can't, we have to socially distance. We can't keep big crowds. So what might you do? You know, 
how can you think out of the box about having some committees or having these things where people can actually, you know, implement uh, processes for consultation and participation? So whether we have to go back to the old suggestion box kind of thing or whether we don't have any contact, right? Or maybe nowadays we do things through email. We do it through a computer system, uh, put it up on a SharePoint. So here's, here's some of our suggestions or whatnot. Or maybe in one organization I went to, um, they had their consultation and participation. They're still doing their, their committee, but they're doing it in a bigger, bigger room. And yet again, another organization was doing this whole idea of communicating, you know, maybe in the more general terms. Um, the plant manager, he actually did, he recorded his uh, meeting, uh, kind of a virtual meeting. He recorded it and it was put on their, uh, on their video screens, like say in their lunchroom, break room, et cetera. Uh, so that people could see it in its entirety. And then, of course, they can always provide um, any kind of feedback they need to, to comments, et cetera. And the other thing that uh, it means, it, it talks about here, the last thing it talks about is supporting the establishment and functioning of health and safety committees. And I kind of, I kind of jumped the gun there a little bit, but, um, you know, again, this is part that I have been um, really picking at with my clients because, you know, just because of COVID-19, it might become one of these things where I'm afraid that it might be a complacency thing. Well, we can't meet because of social distancing. We can't meet because this, that, and the other thing. But we, then that means that we need to figure out other ways of having committees. You have many places. Um, my hometown, for instance, my township that I'm in, um, they have virtual town township meetings, right? They have business that has to be done. It's It's tax business. It's business that is very crucial. So they figured out ways of doing uh, virtual meetings, either some people there in the conference room, the rest of them being online, etc. So we have to be able to understand that uh, as a registrar, we still need to see that we're committed to having these types of meetings in the consultation. It's very, very important to continue that even in and within the climate of the global pandemic. The uh, next area that I wanted to emphasize or discuss is this whole idea of the consultation and participation of workers, this new section, this unique section for the occupation, health, and safety. That is the uh, 5.7, 5.4 in the um, standard here. So basically, what are some of the important things in, in this section? I didn't want to go through the entire section. I didn't think we had time for that. But we need to provide mechanisms, uh, the time, training, and resources for consultation and participation. So we need to provide the timely access to clear and understandable and relevant information about the OHS management system. So those two are really important. You think about it from the time and, and the training and resources. So of course, if you're in an organization that's a high risk, I would assume that you are, you know, you have somebody there that is a health and safety professional. Somebody that is overseeing the management system. It's not somebody that's doing something else and this or somebody that is doing, you know, uh, working in quality and then also part time and working in health and safety part time. But we want to make sure that these guys are, are professionals. Now, of course, if we're talking about someplace that has high risk, we'd want that. But if you're in an organization that's, that, that's doing 45,001 because it's the right thing they feel to do, but they're not in a high-risk in industry or, or a high-risk area uh, for, within their organization, then, of course, there might be some shared responsibilities. We understand that. But we want to make sure that they have the, the proper resources and the proper training. So making sure that that's, that's appropriate. We have to have uh, access to clear and concise in understandable information, and this goes back to back to the old version, 18,001, where it talked about needs to be, you know, le take into consideration the literacy level and the language barriers uh, to make sure that we that everybody can understand, you know, what we're reading and, and what's out there. Uh, we want to write it in such a way that you have to have a college degree in order to understand anything. Determine and remove any obstacles you know, or barriers to participation. So uh, that can be, that you know, and minimize those that can't be. 
So what's it mean by that? Well, there's a couple things. First off, uh, barriers uh, to participation. That could be that, um, you know, everybody's like chained to their, I don't want to say chained. That's kind of a bad word. Because I'm thinking about, you know, to their look, to their uh, assembly. They're doing assembly, doing volumes that are so high that they really can't get away from their job, and they're and they're there. Uh, they may be doing rot- rotation. I don't know. Maybe not because of the you know pandemic, but they're kind of like they're you know they're go 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 go, and they don't have any possibilities of ever being able to you know uh, participate. Uh, you know they can't really. Uh, they don't have time. They they go from, you know, one workstation to another. They take their breaks. They go back to work, and they take their breaks, and they go back to work, et cetera. And, you know, it's just it's just the, the pace of work. You know, sometimes it's other things, like uh, some barriers can't be removed. In other words, somebody's working on third shift. He comes in, you know, maybe 10, 11 o'clock at night, and he leaves 6, 7 o'clock. Sometimes uh, some of the organization doesn't even get there until after, you know, 8 o'clock. And they leave, you know, at like five o'clock in the afternoon or whatever, and you, they'll never their their paths will never cross. So we want to make sure that there's some way of minimizing that kind of a barrier, whether that means having you know training um, or having early or or late at night uh, during that shift, or maybe having that person come over, pay him some overtime, and have them come, have them him or them or she come and, and participate in, 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 in parts of the organization that he wouldn't normally be able to do that, right? So that's where we can try to minimize some of those barriers. Uh, so when I'm talking to leadership, I'm asking him, what are some of these barriers? So I get an understanding. And of course, when I go out and talk to people on the third shift or I go out to talk to people in production, what are some of the barriers to see how those, how those two questions match, right? And then we also want to make sure that we emphasize that um, you know, we are the consultation, you know, consulting with non-managerial workers and emphasizing the participation. Now, there is a note in 45,001. I was preparing for this uh, presentation. I, I went back through that, and it does say, hey, don't forget that this doesn't mean that managers can't participate. <laughs> you know, um, you want the supervisors involved. Uh, I have an organization, rather large organization. And uh, they have multiple sites throughout the world, throughout well, North America at least, that we're, we're involved in. And um, one of the things we see that they do very well is the incident investigation. So when they do the incident investigation, they go through and they investigate. And one of the main things they do is the person that was injured or if they're able, or the person right there next to them, the worker, they are they're right from the very very beginning what happened what was the issue what was the hazard you know why did it happen that kind of thing and doing the whole who what where where who what when where and how uh with the actual workers if they can or people like right there on the shop floor and they're dealing with them they're working with a supervisor and they have like say a uh, health and safety specialist um, involved in that as well so they're making sure that they're participating and that they're consulting with them. How do you consult with a non-managerial worker? Well, one easy way of doing that is through the hazard identification. If somebody is doing a job and they've been doing that job for 30 years, they probably should know what some of the hazards are of that job. And so they're able to talk about all the different categories, you know, slip, trips, and falls, struck by, whether it's heat, pinch points, et cetera. And probably do a really good job of identifying things that are uh, hazardous. And then we go through and make sure what is the level of hazard, right? So these are the things that this is um, now called out in that separate section, um, 5.4 of the ISO 45001 standard. Well, the last pause to look at when we look at the structure for 45001, of course, is the procurement clause. That's uh, 8.1.4. And the reason that's important is because, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first time, other than a quality-based or ISO 9001-based standard, that we've had procurement in there uh, within the standard itself. So, you know, the contractors, when we talk about this whole uh, section, it talks about contractors and outsourcing. So outsourcing, of course, is those things you could do 
but you elect because of lack of uh, resources or because people have to do other things that are more important, you have somebody else or you have a, a vendor or a contractor do that work for you. So you outsource that process. So for contractors, we need to coordinate with the contractors to identify the hazards and assess the controls. That doesn't mean that you as an organization need to do their uh, hazard identification, but you have to coordinate with them, whether that's in through like something like a non a routine uh, job safety analysis, job hazard analysis, whatever you call it. Uh, you need to coordinate their activities and the operations that could have an impact on, uh, on your organization, whether that's construction or bringing a piece of equipment in or actually uh, repairing equipment, right? And then you need to look at the organization's activities, how they impact uh, not only uh, your organizations but the contractors' workers and make sure that your organization activity, so if you have something in that area that's hazardous and they're working in the area, of course, you want to coordinate with that, whether that has to be uh, you have an you know, above-ground storage tank in the area and you want to make sure it's flammable. If, if they're working with, with hot works, make sure you have the proper permitting in, in that kind of activity. So the contractors or activities and operations that impact other interested parties in the workplace. And so if you have, I don't know, uh, some of these large uh, automotive uh, assembly plants have organizations that are right there, work right within their plant, or, or you have other people doing work, uh, whether it's somebody that is a contractor that's there every day, like working, uh, running their wastewater treatment facility, and then if somebody's working in the area, then, of course, that could impact um, other people that are in, have interested parties. And the organization needs to make sure that the requirements – for this occupation health and management system are, are met by contractors and their workers. So uh, a, a key difference here, a very key difference, is that the organization's procurement processes, they need to define and apply the occupational health and safety criteria for the selection of contractors. So this is a very unique terms that we talk about. It talks about you need to have a criteria for the, you know, for the basically the selection, evaluation, and reevaluation. And if you look closely at the ISO 9001, that's exactly what it says there too. So what that means is from the beginning, when you're looking for a new contractor, you need to understand what is going to be your criteria that deals with the occupation health and safety management systems for the selection of contractors. And if you don't have that yet, doesn't mean that you can't migrate, but there might be an area there that you need to work on. And, of course, as a third-party guy, I would issue a minor nonconformance at a minimum so we can then know what's going on moving forward to make sure that we do have this safety criteria. And this criteria, of course, might be specific to the type of work. It might be uh, generic, depending on, you know, your own organization and what you use your contractors for. And it can be very complicated as well, but that's going to be a case-by-case -case basis and we take them in consideration in the migration process, of course. Now, this slide is talking a little bit about the uh, factors that we see that you, will allow you to successfully migrate to the ISO 45001 standard. You can see that we talk about uh, having documented documentation, excuse me, documentation that you've reviewed and internally audited. We need to make sure that your on-site audit for example, either a pre-assessment or gap analysis has allowed you to, to do that process. This is not something that's required by the registrar or required to do, but an on-site audit is the best practice because then you're able to look at that gap analysis. And then, of course, whatever, you, whatever gaps you see in there, you need to address those, uh, identify gaps. And that might be your policy statement. It could be, hey, we don't see much about the way of procurement when we talk about how we're controlling contractors, you know, et cetera. It could be a number of different things, and it will be unique by each individual organization. So you also need to make sure that you undergo uh, the audit that, that will help you migrate to the new standard. So the best practice, of course, is always to provide sufficient time to address any findings. What I mean by that is, you know, usually um, we come into an audit and we think, okay, everything's going to be good. We don't have any non-conformances because everything meets the intent of the standards. But this is a migration audit, so things may be missed. And you want to make sure you give yourself at least 
at least a minimum two months to work on everything so that we can then uh, get the information from you in a timely manner and then do our technical review because all audits will undergo this technical review and that takes some time as well. And they may have questions that we have to come back to you. So again, this, but you gotta give yourself time. Remember that this deadline has been extended because of the impact of the global pandemic. COVID-19 has caused a lot of changes in the world and early on the IAF, the International Assessor Forum, has issued, um, uh, basically has answered the question of how COVID-19 will impact by extending this um, deadline for migration by six months. So now we're looking at the end of September. So you can see that that is coming up close to six months, probably a little over six months by the time we're doing the webinar that you have in order to uh, get your migration done. So we're right in that you know hot zone that everybody's gonna wanna get things done. So give yourself time because not only do you have to have the time for doing the corrective action, but think about the time it takes to get you into the schedule. And so, you know, when we look at this, uh, one key thing to understand, and I don't see this as much as I used to, but early on I would see a lot of things where I would come in and somebody wants to say they were migrating their 9001 from, I don't know, the previous version to, to the 2008 version from 2000 to 2008, Oh, we can just do this on the fly. No, you still have to have a full round of internal audits and the management review. So those are done when you have a new standard, you have to have those done before we can issue that, that basically the migrate you to the 45. Um, again, we don't see as much as we used to, but you have to understand it's not a rolling change. You still have to have that full set of audits to make sure that you meet the intent of the standard and then follow that up by management review. This slide is an introductory slide to the, that will uh, talk a bit more in detail in the following slides, some of the barriers that we find for successful migration. This is through all the uh, history or the data that uh, SGS has um, been able to obtain since the migration started. We talked to them internally about those as being pain points. These are areas that people find uh, that there are going to be issues there might be say not performances written in the, and there'll be things we have to address rather than going from uh, having the audit and having a perfect sheet you know clean sheet we call it uh, some of the key things you see here that basically two out of the pick up over 75 percent almost uh, 80 percent of the activities those things being the lack of operational controls and the lack of uh, performance evaluation we'll talk about those more in the following slides so you can see here that um, based on the previous slide, we might have seen that the lack of operational control is like 55% of the time is what we're going to see as a barrier or a pain point for this migration process. So what we mean by that is when we look at the um, OHS, the risk process, we look about uh, either eliminating or reducing hazards. So when we talk about lack of operational control, that could very well be that we're not looking at this from a perspective of the hierarchy of controls, whether that's the elimination, substitution, engineering controls, et cetera. Um, and so it's unclear to us when we look at these, how are we, what controls are in place for um, addressing uh, the identified hazards and the associated risk. So we've got to make sure that we have a good process in place here. And this is a big portion of the standard between the planning portion where you talk about identification of risk and opportunities, and then of course putting some type of control in place. And the administrative control, that could be training, that could be uh, signage, that might be one of the more common things. Of course, PPE always is either. So when we look at this, there's no specific requirement on which type of control to implement, but that will be based on the level of risk. Uh, if it's something where somebody could actually get maimed or, or injured to the point where they might pass away, they might die. And of course, we'd looked at, you know, how can we eliminate that kind of risk? But there could be engineering controls, as I said, or administrative controls. And then the risk and hazard identification, that really doesn't provide, you know, um, context for controls when we see it in this area. In other words, when we have this type of issue, that's what we mean. Now, that should definitely provide a a context for controls, but what we're saying is and we're seeing where it's not. In other words, you have the risk kind of sitting there and we haven't done anything with it yet or even this disgust 
how we're going to do that, and that's where we would find issues with this type of thing. And these all would end up being uh, part of the pain points in this area for migration process. So the the second one here, 24% of the time, we see that we are there's a lack of performance evaluation. And as between when we talk 55% for the previous one, these first two give us close to like 79%. So give us close to 80% of the issues that we find. So one of the things we need to do is we need to make sure we've identified what needs to be monitored and measured. Okay. And so when we talk about this, it's not just, well, it's out there. Monitoring and measurement can be taken a number of different ways. We have to have methods. The methods for monitoring and measurement need to be established. So if we have a situation where we have, you know, some uh, performance indicators, uh, we have objectives, maybe we even have legal requirements that re resulting of what we need to make sure that we're monitoring that. You know, in the United States, we have such things as the, um, well, the OSHA 300 log, that's a, that's a regulatory requirement. Where are we at with that? Uh, in some states, they have the uh, injury and illness monitoring you need to happen. So, you know, it might be a regulatory requirement, but it could be voluntary, and that's what you need to determine what those are. And when we see issues with that, it's because we haven't really established uh, methods for monitoring and measurement. We might talk about a particular objective, but not really uh, monitoring yet. Yet, And that just, again, might be because it's a new standard. The criteria for which the organization uh, will evaluate the, your performance, you know, I always tell people it's hard to know whether or not you're meeting your performance goals if you don't have a target. You know, how are we going to evaluate whether we're doing well if we don't have some target in place? You know, a common target, of course, is zero injuries. Uh, how will we, when we monitor that, we need to know what that criteria is to say, yeah, we're doing a good job or, or we need to work on some areas. When will the results be analyzed, evaluated, and communicated? That's, usually, that's sometimes not determined. Uh, many times you, you might say, well, we only do it in the management review. But in many cases, management review might happen once a year, so it, it's hard to say whether that's effective if we're not in, in analyzing and looking at these in a little bit more often than, say, annually. Uh, the organization, you know, needs to evaluate OHS performance to determine the effectiveness of the OHS MS. And, and part of that evaluation, of course, will be whether it's an ongoing basis, it evaluates performance, both active, or reactive, excuse me, and proactive. And also, when we talk about that, you know, where are we going to be evaluating this? Is it, like you said, is it going to be during management review? Do we have some uh, part of the management review, you know, output should say, hey, are we doing okay? Is it adequate? Etc. And of course, the monitoring and measurement uh, equipment that we are using to evaluate, and that might be something like, say, you're in a paint shop, or as I said before, you may have a wastewater treatment plant that that does have health and safety requirements there, uh, or you have some other type of activity. You know, how will we monitor and in, in, in the equipment we're using? And, and one thing I see is simeters or the metric type things where we're, we're checking people's uh, hearing, if you have a clinic on site, those are the kind of things that we need to be calibrated. Sometimes they're calibrated gases, other times they're pieces of equipment that meet calibration. And so that's part of the, the performance and evaluation, just an example of something that might have an issue uh, related to the evaluation of your uh, performance for your OHS MS. The last three barriers are not nearly as common. They include the lack of opportunities in evaluation, unable to determine the root cause, and incompetent personnel. Really kind of the opportunities evaluation really goes back to looking at your, um, in uh, Clause 6, they have the, the area of opportunities and what are the um, risks and opportunities, looking at them and making sure that we have a good solid uh, way of evaluating them and that's really what the important part able to determine the root cause this is very important because we need to make sure for every incident uh, we have a way of determining what happened and whether and remember this is also talking about uh, having the employees the workers 
uh, participating as well. We want to make sure that when we look at that, we also take into consideration the impact of any changes from this root cause analysis that is then deployed throughout the rest of the organization as well, or especially within the management system. And of course, when we talk about competency of personnel, it's really the important things is not that everybody is competent, but that we have everybody being aware and those folks that need competency, whether they happen to be maintenance personnel, like with lockout tag out or arc flash, or maybe even emergency responders where we have to have, you know, incident commanders and in some organizations we've got to have uh, first first aid training, et cetera. And sometimes that training has to be um, repeated. We've got to make sure that that's done on a, on a timely basis. And so these are the three areas we're talking about here in the uh, barriers for migration. And we did mention this a little bit earlier, but SGS, we think that we can help. We can help you to promote your, your uh, OHS systems within your organization uh, through the ISO 45001 certification. So we talked about the steps of certification already. You know, we can look at this. We can say we, we do these reviews. We do all that. We can help you to do that transition through training. Through uh, We can do this through the pre-audits. The certification audit, definitely, that's kind of what we do for a living. And then, of course, uh, reference materials, whether that be white papers or otherwise, I'm sure we can help you out with that as well. Finally, uh, SGS also has training courses that are geared towards the ISO 45001. As you can see through here, there's uh, different training, whether it's uh, from uh, 45 minutes through, you know, five days. We're talking about training on uh, introductory type courses to courses about internal auditor training. If you've already got training, I guess you'd have the, the two day. And then of course the full training would be the five days. That's what every registrar has to go through, something like that. Anybody that wants to be a third party auditor, in other words. There's other training you can see on the other here, uh, anywhere from uh, two to up to five days uh, through integrated management system type training for 9,114 and 45,001. So again, we're here to help, and we hope that we have these kind of uh, training activities for you that we can provide you uh, help in the future. Well, this is the end. I want to thank you for your attention, for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact me. Here's my contact information. I know there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions uh, and submit those in, in the Q&A, and I will get back with you as I can as 